I like to dwell on the uh, picture here of camels wandering aimlessly through the desert looking for the oasis. There's another version of this picture around that has me sitting on a camel in uh, southwestern Pakistan many years ago. I had a perm uh, looking at a watering hole and people think that's great, but the marketing team at Stantec won't let me show that picture anymore because it doesn't meet standards or something like that. Anyway, uh, as always, we've been asked, you get a stand ticket at a glance for those of you, of course, uh, I guess mostly from Western Canada, we're not an unknown entity. We've been around since 1954, founded by Dr. Stanley, who had a choice between taking his master's degree in environmental engineering and, you, and turning into a consultant or playing hockey for the Chicago Blackhawks back in the 16 uh, league. His cousin, Alan Stanley, won the Stanley Cup with the uh, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs the last time they won. So anyway, <laughs> since then the company has grown, uh, you know, not a lot much different than I'll say than and, uh, Charest and WSP and so on. Uh, we're publicly traded. We've been 61 years of uninsurability. Uh, we're not a not-for-profit organization. We're proud of that. I know that doesn't match with everyone's expectations as Canadians nonetheless. Uh, we've grown to getting close to $3 billion a year in revenue uh, with our acquisition that hopefully will proceed of MWH will be somewhere around $4.5 billion or whatever. But anyway, uh, size is of some degree important. There are economies of scale, and, but of course, I think everyone agree being better is what we really would achieve for. We have 250 locations, 15,000 employees, uh, and we are a truly uh, diverse firm, we don't focus on too many different, we focus on a lot of different areas. Yes, we rank, uh, I know of course I have to put up with the uh, WSP presentation, you know, he's got more number ones and twos than we do here, but blah, 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 that's not really important. <laughs> <laughs> so, sectors we work in. So we, we're, uh, we're grouped into three basic sectors, buildings, uh, energy and resources and infrastructure. Of course, everyone understands that energy and uh, resources, uh, which was a booming business as little as a year and a half ago, is now a bit down in the dumps, but still uh, a good business for everybody. This, uh, there are parts of the world where it is the business, the Middle East, and still doing relatively well. Uh, each of these sectors are roughly the same size in Stantec. Uh, and we, which is kind of why they're grouped that way, and they tend to have similar clients, again, around their groupings. Uh, where we work, uh, one could say we just randomly colored in a map of the world, because as I was sitting looking at it and going, well, I know we worked in Vietnam, but someone reminded me that, well, that was more than 20 years ago, and we, haven't, we don't show anything where we haven't worked in 20 years. So there's lots of uh, orange on there. I asked why we couldn't make it red and make it look like the Commonwealth or the British Empire, but I was told that that didn't work either, and people don't really appreciate my sense of humor in the marketing department. So while, uh, while the map is very colorful, uh, I, I do say that you know while this is an IFI forum type thing, of course, where Stantec is focused today is in North America. We are a North American firm. Half of our business is in the United States, half of it is in Canada, 3% is international. Now we've always been a 2 to 4% international business. Uh, of course we're a lot larger than, uh, than we, uh, when Dr. Stanley started out and when I joined the firm in 1985 when we had 200 employees. But we've always done some international work. Uh, there's always been an appeal to it, I'll call it sex appeal if you like. Nonetheless, it is an interesting business and people do appreciate the opportunity to work outside of their home city, province, state, country. It's always way more exciting when you're an Edmontonian to be doing a job in Kelowna, or sorry, let me pick a better example, uh, <laughs> Smythe, British Columbia, than it is in St. Albert. I don't know what it is, but the whole appeal of being able to fly somewhere and get off a plane and work is much more appealing. So by sector, what again, as you can see, the little gray areas of the international components here, energy and resources or a third of, of our international revenue, which is roughly $100 million a year. It's not a small amount in the, in a, in a, in the overall context, but within Stantec it is. Our buildings business is roughly 70 to 75%, and part of the reason of that is that we have a, a, a large buildings architectural engineering practice in the United Kingdom and in, and in the Middle East, and that's what they tend to focus on. 
Infrastructure, we do roughly 0 to 5 percent, but a lot of that work is IFI work, just because of the way things get funded. So, our approach to international business is probably key to how we go about being successful at it. Not a lot different than working in North America. It is a local presence that makes a difference. And you heard that multiple times already today, is that having a local presence, local relationships, and understanding the client is critical to making clients feel comfortable with you and knowing that you will understand their issues. And in some cases, it's very important, the ability to be able to say, I need to see you this afternoon, not next Tuesday and being able to drive down the street or make a short plane flight somewhere in the Caribbean or whatever to get to where we need to be. Roughly a quarter of our work is following clients. We follow a lot of North American clients to other countries. Uh, mining companies would be a good example, but lots of people like McCain, who, do, who, who have French fry plants around the world. Uh, Simplot, who's an agribusiness agri that has plants in China and all kinds of places. Following them, much like working for IFIs, is you're getting paid in your own currency, or American dollars in some cases. Uh, you are dealing with clients who have similar sets of values and, re and relationships to you, and do business in a similar manner to what you're used to. And that makes it very comfortable. Uh, roughly 5% of our business is following specific high probability pursuits. There are, of course, hundreds of thousands of opportunities around but you can't be successful chasing everything. You need to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. So for us, it's a small part of our business, but it's also one where the IFI projects are very important. Our clients are literally anybody and everybody. Uh, it's not that we won't work for everybody, but we will work for all types of clients. We are not focused only on public sector or only on private sector or only on mining clients. We do work for everybody and so we have a broad range of experience. IFIs are important to us because, as it's been said earlier, they have uh, a set established rules, payment processes and so on that you can feel comfortable with. And for us, corruption is a huge problem. We have a reputation that we've spent 50, 60 years building, and we do not want to blow it on some stupid thing in some country far away that your typical Canadian or American cannot find on a map uh, just because it winds up being in headlines. And that's the unfortunate part of being a larger publicly traded company is that those things do get people in trouble. So the IFI does offer us an opportunity on a high probability pursuit to satisfy our concerns about who we're working with and how we're working and does provide some protection. So we do somewhere in the order of three to five IFI funded projects per year. It varies, you know, over the last 10 years we've done about 50 of them. Uh, some years we've done a lot more, some have dragged on, you know, many years, and, but in many cases we typically have three to five on per year. We've worked with all of the multinational, multi national development banks uh, over the years, uh, you know, and I think we've, surprisingly to me, I just heard a couple of people mention that, you know, they're not having much success with the Asian Development Bank, and that is exactly what we, a uh, piece of information we would share. Uh, I hadn't thought about it that way, but our focus has moved away from the ADB, which is where it was some 15, 20 years ago, where the opportunities lay in Southeast Asia and developing countries like China and India, and moved on to other places where we're finding we can still be competitive because those markets have matured. I often use the example of the Middle East, where there was a time uh, and, uh, where you could fly in from London, England, and be the, and uh, this is not politically correct or whatever, just, you know, to be the, the great European who showed up to show the locals how it's done. Now those clients, as we all know, have hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank and they expect their consultants to be located down the street. They, do, they expect a local office, they expect you registered there, and they expect you to follow all of their processes. They have the money and they demand the respect and they get it. So, kind of projects we've worked on, this is just a cross-section of things over the, from the last 15 years, roughly. Uh, you know, we've done everything from hydroelectric plants in China, uh, you know, environmental monitoring, 
all the way down to you know, in vulner vulnerability assessment of emergency shelters at schools for St. Vincent in the island of St. Vincent. Uh, so we do a wide range of projects, but as I said, what we found is that we've been moving away from the ADB and so on and focusing much more on what I'll call Caribbean Development Bank and IDB work, which is the Caribbean and Latin America. And the reason for that is partly uh, because we still find that we can be very competitive there. We have local offices which give us some sort of local presence and the ability to service the client with some of our skill sets from there. Um, and we also find the time zones a lot less trouble. It is a real struggle to get up at four in the morning to have a call with someone in India who is still at work at seven at night. Uh, they tend to work later there anyways. You know, you can do that once or twice, but after a few months of doing this every second week, you know, you're going, well, I'm starting to lose interest in this. And so you move, you move on to something else. Caribbean, Latin America, it's north-south, roughly the same time zones, you can make it work. So uh, similarly, you know, we run most of our Middle East stuff is coordinated by a fellow who lives in New Brunswick, because he's three hours closer than we are here in Edmonton, and therefore it is just much easier for him to have a call with London or Dubai than it is for us in the West. So a little brief case study for success, you're not going to see or hear anything different than what you've heard earlier. These are the same things I would say if I was talking about history of success for us in Red Deer, Alberta. It's, again, a lot about local presence and understanding your client. The Fort Water Supply Redevelopment Project on the island of St. Lucia. We've got a history of projects on that island. We've been working there off and on for 20 some years. We know the client. We've actually watched the client go through what we'll call succession planning, where one relative replaces another uh, as they move along. Uh, but you actually know people there. We have a strong local partner. We've spent a lot of time over the years trying to find uh, a small firm. Well, they all tend to be small. Often their one-man operations are slightly more than that, who have a good reputation for upstanding in the community, good work, reliable. Those three things don't come together all that often in many of these places. Nonetheless, when you find them, you want to work with them. We track the project well in advance of the pre-qualification expression of interest stage. So we knew it was coming. We were doing exactly what was described earlier this morning, looking through pipelines, talking to our local partner, understanding what might be in the government's budget in the next year or two. Of course, what they tell you is not the next year or two. If you take a three to five year horizon, you're probably much closer. But at least you know what's coming and you can think about it. We had some meetings in advance with the end client, uh, you know, so that we sort of tried to understand what their issues were. And we understood their technical needs and local preferences. And I know the comment was made earlier this morning about European firms complaining the technology you're asking for is too old. But the reality is, is the technology you leave, need to leave behind needs to be repairable wherever it is. And that doesn't mean that they're not smart or quite capable of repairing uh, uh, intelligent uh, infrastructure or equipment and so on. But the reality is, is that your average mechanic in Canada is much happier with an old carburetor than he is with an electronic box that he has to go rip out of the car and go down to the auto parts store and pay an outrageous sum of money to replace when he could have done it himself. And so often the technology and the technical needs need to be relatively basic. And many of their clients understand that because they have a limited amount of foreign currency and they cannot be spending it on replacement parts. They need, they need to be able to fix it locally. Whether they do or not is another matter, but that's okay. So we also understood the team needs, and I think this is an area, and I'll get into just a little bit more detail than some others touched on here, is that resumes are very important. You cannot just take something off the shelf. You really, really do need to customize it. Often cases, customizing a resume, it has to be, of course, truthful. But sometimes by actually taking projects out of people's resumes and not showing them infers that someone has actually been more of an expert in a subject because they don't look show quite as much as a generalist. You need to focus on what it is you're trying to sell. And I, I know others have said that too. And make sure that those key words that you read in the terms of reference appear in people's resume. Because often the people reviewing these things are working off a checklist. And if it says you need, you need to have a mechanical expert in something or other, 
and the person's done that, you need to make sure that is highlighted in their resume. You cannot assume that the person reading it is going to read that into it, because if I cannot read a Stantec proposal, uh, the thought of having to read six proposals written by people is beyond comprehension. I have no idea how any of our clients ever do that, so I give them credit. So all the roles must be filled by capable people. Uh, the this phrase this morning was, you know, you need a strong project manager, and I cannot emphasize that enough. But when they ask for six people on a team, you need to make sure that you have more than just a couple of stars, because the two or three that aren't all that strong, they will detract from your stars. And your really, really good project manager, who's very important to the success of the project, his score will get overwhelmed by mediocrity further down the list. So finding the teammates is important. The other, other thing, and it's a little bit of a gripe on my part because I only have a Bachelor of Science degree, is that advanced degrees seem exceedingly important. 30 years or 40 years of experience doesn't seem to mean as much as having a PhD in something that's asked for. And I can only say that when someone says they need a master's in something, you really, really should try and give them a master's. I don't really care and they don't care that you have someone who knows this subject inside out. If they're working off a checklist, chances are the lack of a master's or a PhD is, is going to score you down. And it's very disappointing, but that's the reality of it. And you know what? That happens here in Canada too. Cost-effective team. As much as we'd like to talk about quality-based selection and blah, 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 and how we're all the best, uh, I've learned to live after all these years with have to accept the fact that, you know what? Those guys at WSP and MMM, once in a while, they're actually more qualified and better than us. They weren't just cheaper. And so uh, you still need to be... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, just so you know, I, I, had a, uh, I am actually partnered with MMM on a job, and we had a call this morning. They're a great bunch, so it's, this is all in good fun. So uh, where you can be locally or regionally based does cut down on expenses. And that goes back, you know, to the comment about the ADB and so on. Uh, you know, local people do have lower salaries. We are well paid in this part of the world. The reality, though, is that the Scandinavians, who are very highly paid, still manage to compete, which tells you that maybe we could be a little bit more productive and a little bit uh, tighter on the number of hours or man months we need. You need a committed and experienced team lead. Everybody wants to go to the Caribbean. Everybody wants to go to Panama. Everybody wants to go to Costa Rica. But you know, it's a little bit different when you get there and discover that you've got to do all this work by yourself because no one else seems to help you out. Uh, nothing goes as quickly as you hope it will. Uh, you do need people who are there to make sure that things get through. It cannot be a cute and nice place to go for a vacation where somebody's going to pay me. Lastly, you need team members who have flexible schedules. I do know that every RFP says that the client will review this in a three week period. Three weeks means three months. So if the assumption is that you're going to send your project manager down there, he and his team are going to spend a month doing the work and then they'll sit around and take a couple of weeks vacation while the client reviews this, I guarantee you they're wrong because you will find you've got people sitting there twiddling their thumbs, costing you money. And so you need to have people who could come back and find something useful to do on another project. And those people are not all that easy to find because one of the challenges when you send someone an international assignment is they get forgotten about at home. Their work gets taken over by somebody else and then when they come back, there's nothing for them to do, especially if they're only coming back for three or four weeks. So you really do have to manage your time. So in conclusion, we're continuing to grow. Uh, as I said, Stantec's uh, model has been focused on North America with the pending acquisition of Montgomery Watts and Herzog. Uh, you know, that will change. We'll go from 3% of our business being international to 25% of it for a firm that's 50% larger than it is today. That's going to cause us a lot of changes and so on. We continue to chase IFI projects. MWH certainly does. IFI projects, how 
they do them and their model is a little bit different than what we currently do, but there's probably something that we can learn from it. As you can see, the projects we're chasing up on the list here are all in really nice, glamorous places that uh, we, uh, we all want to go to and work at. Uh, you know, the, the tougher places, and I've spent many a time in Mozambique, Pakistan, uh, Tanzania, Vietnam, before any other North Americans were ever there. Uh, and I can tell you that the Sudan is not high on my places to go back to. Uh, for good reason. So anyway, I uh, thank everyone for the chance here and we'll leave the questions up because we're at that point in the presentations. Thank you.